Well, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Hello from, <clears throat> excuse me, ALBW Live. My name is Pat Eskate. I am the lead organizer of Ann Lister Birthday Week, and I am your host for ALBW Live. So um, let's just start by saying that for most of us, when we first discovered Ann Lister through the magic of Sally Wainwright's Gentleman Jack, we went to the internet and started madly looking for some sort of information about her and really found very little out there. Now, in the last two and a half years since that time, there's been a lot that's been written about Ann Lister. There's many people working on many things, but there is one group that took the time to start collating all of that information and bringing it together in one spot while also creating some really wonderful things on their own. So today it is my great pleasure to talk with the <clears throat> one of the original instigators of that site and an ex-ALBW live teammate, Livia Labate. Hello, Liv. Uh-oh, are you, uh, do we have a technical difficulty? Can't hear you. Hey, Pat. There you are. Okay, good, <laughs> excellent. Okay, Liv, so, um, let's start out. What was your what was your starting motivation for working out Pack with Potential? Well, after one, watching Gentleman Jack, I immediately went online and found others who were just as astounded by finding this remarkable woman that was not only a great character but also a really fascinating human being. And yeah. I needed to know more. So, as a, a daughter and granddaughter of librarians, I directly went for the books. And, and it became very apparent very quickly to me that there were several interesting ones. You had uh, Helena Whitbread and Joe Liddington and Choma had the books out, but their availability in the US and UK and elsewhere was sort of uneven. And there were also different editions with different covers. So it was a bit confusing to get started. Uh, and it wasn't clear like which, what do each of them cover? Like, where do I begin? Uh, so I try to get them all, uh, but in the process of like just trying to discover that, I thought nobody should have to spend time trying to figure this out again. So let me make right. a list so that people can tell what's what uh, and ended up becoming a spreadsheet. And I put everything that I found there, editions, covers. And then I pinged Staff Galloway and Marlene Oliveira on Twitter, who I'd been following uh, for the transcription project. And I asked if they would check my work and add anything that was missing. Um, and that spreadsheet got passed around on social media and eventually got too big and too complex to be useful. So I uh, decided to transition that to a web page to make it a little easier to find. And that's when the Endless Turk book concierge came about. Uh, and that was really the first thing that we put up on the site. Excellent. Now, um, before we go any further, for those people who may not recognize the line packed with potential, tell us a little bit about where that came from. Oh, I, that's one of the, the moments in Gentleman Jack that really struck me. Uh, and uh, it really, I think Sally captured the essence of Ann Lister so well in that scene when she talks about how every moment is an inexplicable delight packed with potential. It just encapsulates so well just the spirit of Ann Lister and then that, that thirst for knowledge and everything is interesting to her. Uh, and it seemed like a really suitable way to kind of express that in terms of like uh, bringing resources about her and uh, of her. Right, it's really a great grab, by the way. I love that, I love that you use that. So, so here you are, you've got this, it, the, the spreadsheet has become too unwieldy. So how did it wind up online and, and how did people start to find it and start mm -hmm. to get involved with it? Now, just for the audience, we're going to get down into the details of the site, but we just want to cover how it all happened first. Yeah, well, to to your to your point, like everyone in sort of late 2019 was trying to be in every social media group, every reading every blog post, or listening to every podcast where Ann Lister was being discussed, uh, and we were extremely eager to go wherever that information was. And uh, there were a lot of conversations happening in lots of different spaces. Like there's, there wasn't just one thing, like there were groups in Facebook and Twitter, et cetera. And people started just sharing things that they found, dissertations or spreadsheets of interesting links. Um, and then we would just ask each other, you know, where did you find this? Um, uh, are there any other things that you would recommend that you've already read, that you liked, what did you like or didn't like? 
Uh, so some of these conversations are even still public. If you just search on Twitter, hashtag and Lister and go back in time, you can see all of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, but you know, at one point we put the contact form on the website, and people just would just contact and say, "Hey, do you know anything about this topic?" Or I found this, but I don't see it anywhere. So can, do you want to post it on the site? That sort of a thing. Right. And um, there were all, already a lot of people involved in the West York Chart Archive Services project for transcribing uh, uh, and Lister's journals, and so everyone watching that project develop, they had this opportunity to really starting to like engage directly with the journals fully, not just snippets from the various books. Right. And so everyone had very different motivation for researching Enlister. Um, and uh, most people not doing this professionally, right? They, everyone has like a day job or caretaking responsibilities and doing this research is more passion driven and that's essentially people's most precious personal time. They're spending that time with Enlister now. So right. as folks started to learn more and share more, these exchanges just became more visible. And many code breakers created blogs uh, with their transcriptions. Amanda Price started the Enlister timeline. Uh, Kim Doris uh, spearheaded the N Walker Wikipedia page extension and a lot of translations. Like there was just a lot of activity in a lot of different areas. And it's such a large international crowd of like really passionate people. So uh, we continue to ask the question, can we make it a little bit easier to find this information? Uh, and then how can we make it a little bit easier for people to continue to connect in the, all these like creative, uh, useful ways? So in the end, it was less about people finding us as a website and more about everyone continuing to pay attention to what was happening and finding each other as individuals and then asking these questions and simply just choosing to do more things together. And the website just became a convenient place where we can put things once these things are happening. Right, you know, one, I think one of the things that's been really outstanding about, um, about Gentleman Jack and then leading to Ann Lister is that there is so much work being done and it wasn't just a flash in the pan because this is a real person with a real history and a real impact on the world around her then and the world around us now mm -hmm. that there's just an outstanding amount of research that continues to go on on a daily basis. I mean, this stuff pops up all the time. So why don't we jump into the website and um, tell us a little bit about what you've divided the website into some particular groups. Tell us what those groups are. Yeah, so the idea is that the website should be a convenient starting point, right? So it serves as a repository for references and resources that people can find and contribute, uh, a place to share new work if you're if you're exploring something, uh, as well as a place to facilitate communication around this community-driven project. So, uh, of course, we want to encourage people to engage with Enlister through her own words. Uh, so you see things like, for example, the timelines and the story maps, which there are over 20 right now. And this is a concept that Amanda Price started and introduced, and folks have really embraced it because it's such a wonderful tool to concisely uh, tell these stories, both showcasing the specific stories about, you know, uh, and this is travels, but also expose folks to a thread that they can pull themselves and dig in for more. Uh, so, and, and ask new questions and draw on their own conclusions. So I love those because they are really great ways for people to get started because they have like a particular interest. For example, like if you're from the Netherlands, you're like, oh, she went there, let me look at this story. And then you can start digging into those kinds of things. Right, uh, and, the great, and the great thing about it is if, if you're in the Netherlands and you say, let's dig into this story, then you're posting that information to the website so other people can take advantage of, of your particular local knowledge, right? Yeah, and it raises questions like, does this place still exist? Is this yeah. hotel still there? And people go and visit and bring that back and like we can learn so much. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, likewise, having a way to just find all those books that exist about Endless or like that continues to grow. Uh, all the academic work that's out there, other articles and published resources that are available, we sort of just compile a big list. Like it's a little bit uh, hard to navigate at this point because there's now so much. Uh, right. We need to figure out a better way to make that more digestible, but it's there. The, the point is like it should be less cumbersome to find it. Um, uh, but the thing that's most popular on the site is still a uh, list of all the transcription blogs because people really want to see uh, the journals with their own eyes and the transcriptions are the way to get there. Uh, and until they're all compiled uh, with the archives, uh, the the, transcript, the transcribers have been so generous just releasing that as they go. And so 
that is the number one thing people come to the site for still. Very um, nice. Um, quick question, and I think we touched on this in our pre-chat, but I'm not sure. Are you linked to Eliza Left Us? Uh, yeah, Eliza Left Us has a compilation of all the journal entries with dates, which, you know, it's a little bit hard if you go directly to the archive website, you have to like figure out which entries for what date. So that provides you like a very quick entry point if you're just like, what was she doing on this date? And you can go check it out or, or have a reference and things like that. It's a great resource. Yeah, it's really amazing. So, and, and so the, and that to, to the audience, that is just one, one, one tiny little link that you'll find on this site. So let's, Let's, why don't we start talking about those those three um, separations and some of the projects that you have yeah. going on so in there. Then we have the the journal uh, tracker projects, right? The the transcribed journals unlock endless opportunities to understand and list their over a lifetime. But everyone is interested in different things, and everyone brings different experiences and lenses into and lister. But uh, the purpose of a tracker is to examine a specific aspect of endless for journals and log that information so we can have some traceability and be able to work with that information in more practical ways. So this is where response has been absolutely amazing. I'm beyond grateful and so impressed with all of the over 60 people uh, who have so far participated in these projects in some, in some capacity. Um, the process of contributing to the tracker is informative on its own because it's forcing us to we read passages of the journal with a particular topic in mind and then register that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're using spreadsheets uh, so we don't burden anyone with like difficult tooling or uh, anyone has visibility to all the data that everyone else is, is providing. So we're just trying to keep the, the level of entry, like no barriers for entry and participation. Uh, right. Eventually we'll be able to look across all this data set that we're assembling and further ask questions about Enlister. Like do, what do we learn from having such detailed information about her and her friends' periods. What does the knowledge of the weather in such detail tells us about Yorkshire of her time? Like the possibilities are, are enormous here. So these projects are ongoing and we try to create a balance so that contributing is easy um, and not too laborious, but also creates a strong, reliable data set that we can confidently explore down the line. So we'll, we'll be at it for a while. Uh, there are a lot of journal to cover. Uh, and we'll try to help people with new ideas to start new ones as well, uh, which is something that happens all the time. So like a good example would be um, the Endless for People project. Uh, so let's go to that one. So, so this project, um, Endlister mentions a lot of people all of the time in the journals and in her correspondence as well. And is it the same name for the same person 20 years apart? Which which Miss Walker is she talking about and when? Uh, uh, and also her spelling often is dreadful. Uh, so it's very uh, challenging sometimes to be like, is she talking about the same person or is this a different person with a slightly different name? Uh, so having a reference built from the actual information, I'm gonna skip, I'm just gonna open the spreadsheet uh, of every name that she mentions alphabetically should help you as you're doing your own research validate those questions and also you can contribute um, and there are references out there there's um, uh, the calderdale companions a wonderful website with a lot of resources inclusive of names of local folks uh, but of course and lists are travel far and wide so this is a much more extensive list of people relating to Endlister. Uh, and I, at this point, I lost track of how many people we have logged, but it is a very long list. <laughs> and what's interesting is that is, as you start digging to some of the people, uh, folks start adding, you know, uh, not just birthdays to get a sense of where they were in time, but like who they were relative to her. Like, how does she come to know this person? Why are they important? Um, and so this provides just a good starting. Yeah, we have over like 1,100. Uh, people entered here at this point. So it's it's vast um, and it really helps us make sense of like who she means for what purposes and why she may, may be trying to impress someone or why she may uh, talk down on someone at times. Like it gives you a little bit of that context and just help kind of provide context for further research. Right. Uh, so that's one of those. Um, uh, before you jump on there, Liv, I, I did want to make mention of something that you brought up, uh, the Calderdale Companion. For those of you out there that are interested sort of in the broader version of Halifax, because as Liv says, Pack with Potential and what we just looked at is really specific to Anne's life. 
Um, the site that she's talking about is called Malcolm Bulls, Calderdale Companion, and it's fascinating. I have no idea how many decades this man has been working on this site, but it includes photographs of places. It 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 ties different families to one another. So, from the aspect of of Yorkshire and Calderdale as a whole, if you're an interesting history nerd, check that out. Yeah, okay. it's a great, great resource. Um, yeah. Another one we can talk about is the Endlister Bookshelf, uh, which was actually the first tracker that we started. Um, and you know, books mattered a great deal to Endlister, and we know what an avid reader she was. We know she invested in uh, time and money in building an entire tower at Shibden Hall to house her library. So we know she even bribed the local librarian so she could get more books at a time than it was permitted. So books were really important to her, but we know all this because she told us through her journals. Well, right. what else can she tell us if we look across the years? So the bookshelf is an effort to extract from the journals each time she mentions a book or a periodical, and what can we learn about her language skills or what impact the classics had on her or what kinds of magazine were part of her day-to-day? -day? Did she have subscriptions? What kind of fiction did she use to read? Um, and you know, what were the books that really helped her understand herself? Um, why did she read juvenile satire so many times? Like there's some interesting information there that if we look across time and across this pattern of, of avid consumption of books, uh, there's a lot of learn to learn there. And uh, we have collected so far, I think over 610, 15 books. Uh, and what's really fun, I think as part of doing this logging of the books is not just capturing that information, but then pursuing like, okay, what is this book? And then we also have here um, references to like where where they can be found today. Like, is there a current copy of this book available? So you can dig in and start exploring. Uh, more recently, we introduced a new column here, which is a new data point we wanna capture is, did Anne have a particular opinion of the books? Like what was her review of the work? She often will uh, mention that. So we're going back now and starting to capture that as well. So, uh, so far it's provided already some good insights about like the different languages that she's read, uh, different categories of books. So over time, I think we'll be able to look at that as a whole and, and find some interesting new things here. Liv, did she, uh, you mentioned, you used the word novel. Did, did she partake of novels very regularly? Yeah, she, she is uh, equally a fan of fiction and nonfiction. Absolutely. Uh, definitely more on the classics, uh, but that's a great question because like a little bit of analysis that we can already do is that uh, how old were the books that she was reading relative to her time? Was she reading current things? Was she reading more older classic things? And you see there, there's a change over like her younger self and her later uh, older self in, in terms of those practices. So that's like actively the kind of thing that we're looking at, but right, yeah, we'll definitely be sharing more of that as we, as we look at this data set. Um, what else? Let's look at um, Ann Lister's sketchbook. That's a good one. Or Ann Walker's sketchbook. Ann Walker's sketchbook, right. So that's the thing, right? Uh, uh, before uh, Ann Walker's uh, journal came about, uh, when uh, Diane uh, looked through in the archives and, and came across that wonderful resource, uh, all we could speak you know, or understand and walk her both through and Lister's um, words, right? She was really providing insight into that. But there's still a really valuable thing to really understand like every time that Anne talks about and walk her sketching or watercoloring, uh, those entries really are very specific and provide detail on what kinds of uh, things that she was doing, like not just the type of thing that she was sketching or drawing, but where they were, what was the context. So if we ever come across uh, a watercolor that might be attributed to Ann Walker, this could provide a very easy reference to say, oh, if this could be co correlated to a particular point in time, we can see some evidence here about that existing or having been done at that time, for example. Well Liv, you bring up a question or you bring up a point that I'm wondering if you all have done any further research on. Um, I've heard from a couple of sources that it appears that there are there are actually several more portraits of Anne Lister that may be out in the world, mm -hmm. uh, other than the ones that we're familiar with, which aren't a lot, by the way. 
Um, do you have you been doing any more research on that? Has anybody in the group kind of grabbed onto that to see what they can find out? Yeah, we started looking at some references there. Uh, got derailed by other projects, and that's the the challenge of having yeah. too many interesting things to look at. Uh, but so far that I have seen, I haven't seen a specific evidence of it. But uh, it's the kind of thing that we're like opportunistically looking for whenever yeah. we find a new uh, reference that may either speak to the artist that was working with her that we know. Uh, right. So continuing to dig into that one. But I think it would be how fun would it be to find something like that? Yeah. Um, Let's see, one more example, just to get a sense of how the trackers work. Uh, let's go over to our life hacks tracker. Uh, now, with as, as Liv grabs that, I just want to say that one of the, the really wonderful things, um, when I was in Halifax for the first time and saw the diaries in the display case in the library for the first time, was that they didn't, weren't just showing the diary. They also had her travel journals and, as Liv's talking about, kind of the life hack things. Um, and Lister actually kept records of home remedies and all sorts of different things, right? Yeah, and being interested in everything, of, of course, she also had an opinion on everything. So uh, this was uh, Yannicka's idea, which is wonderful. And I think I have it open right here to give you a better sense. Uh, so, uh, and as with most trackers, we try to always have the date reference as well as the archival reference so that we can easily jump back into the journal itself to explore the context around the entry. Uh, and this one classifies what kinds of life hacks she is talking about here, outdoors, artisan things, me medicinal household items, and then it's a solution for some kind of a problem, muddy paths or causing vomiting, like she has an opinion on everything. Uh, and then here we have the, the actual quote uh, in details of transcription of what she is saying and a little summary of uh, what she is recommending for this particular situation. It's really fascinating and spans so many categories, including dancing for constipation, for example. <laughs> It's just really fun to dig into this kind of detail uh, from Ann Lister. That's really amazing. Yeah. What a woman. Yeah. Um, before we, we were going to talk, we were going to move into the resources and their stories part, but something that we skipped over a little too quickly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you approach this as a community, because you're very clear on how people get involved, how they can get involved, et cetera. So could you speak to that a little bit about how you view this as a whole? Yeah, sure. Uh, so specifically with the trackers, because they're the most tangible example of a project where you have uh, dozens of collaborators happening at the same time. Um, uh, what usually happens is someone has the idea, like Yannicka suggested this one, and we're like, okay, sure, let's get started. Let's put the spreadsheet together. Let's write a summary of like what is the scope of this project trying to accomplish, and let's put a page up so people can learn about it. And then uh, people are invited to like contact us if they want to participate. Uh, and the only reason for that is that we don't want any random person on the internet messing with this data. So yeah. by yeah. saying I'm interested in participating, we just give you access to the spreadsheet itself so you can enter data. But once you do that, that's it. It's open-ended. And uh, whether you're actively transcribing or you just have access to transcriptions, you can participate logging these items. So usually it just comes through our contact form and then someone, one of us will authorize, and then people are just ready to go. Uh, and in each of the spreadsheets, you know, there's, we're asking for different types of data. So they each have also guidance of like, what specifically should you enter? Uh, like, this is just to make sure that, you know, we're entering data in the same way. And um, uh, is it okay to have duplicates? Like, how are we gonna handle the data hygiene types of problems, right? Like more technically. Yeah. Um, but uh, then the project is open-ended. None of these trackers are complete until we have, you know, seen all of the journals and being able to look at from the lens of the tracker at the whole set. So these will be running for a long time. So I don't know what it will look like when we reach the end for this. But uh, the expectation is for any one of these, you can have a round of analysis for just from the data set standpoint, like we mentioned the bookshelf, like some questions you can ask about books uh, in the same way you can look at other other lenses there. So I think we're going to have like a whole new wave of 
other projects that will come as a consequence of having this data uh, a little more fleshed out. Um, and so participation is everyone is super welcome to come in and join as people have. And just to try to make it easier for everyone, if you're like, oh, I'm interested in this tracker, we'll give you access to all of them. So that if you were like, oh, I want to be on this other one, there's no friction. You just start. And so it's been pretty fluid in that way. Great. Um, so then let's talk a little bit. The next section that you had listed was resources. Yeah. So uh, the resources is really kind of reinforcing that point of like, don't 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 worry about doing all this boring work we did in the first time of going to Google and other references and digging all that out and just trying to surface those a little more. So there are really uh, a lot, of course, the the list of blogs that I mentioned that have transcriptions, uh, research references is really that extensive list of like everything that we could find relating to Enlister, but provides a little bit of context, such as like if this is open access or paid access. So you might need to, you know, use your university library or something to get to this information. But uh, we're always getting suggestions from people via our contact form to add. So this is a growing database. Um, so uh, I'm sorry. So I know that um, the Ann Lister Society, who's going to be having their first in-person uh, conference at uh, ALBW next April, uh, there are a number, <clears throat> excuse me, of academic papers in the work. I think uh, Lori has over 20 people that have submitted at this point. And so once those things have been published, once they're ready for publication, et cetera, would we be able to find those on here as well? I'm yeah. just willing to list them. Absolutely. And as people release anything out into the world, whether it's uh, the final paper, drafts or something, we can start introducing them here. And if you just, you know, the other day, uh, Anna Clark gave a talk about the paper she's working on. And so like trying to provide these references as they are developing is interesting to everyone who is who is uh, currently engaging with these projects. So we're, we're going to add to this as quickly as people surface new things. Are you, push, um, are you pushing that information as well in terms of if you hear about this? Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how you communicate out into the world. I know that you're more of a Twitter user. I am the social media moron of the entire Amlister community, by the way. So I asked this question um, for good reason. Uh, so let's say, for example, we hear that uh, someone's going to be giving a talk on their paper. Are you disseminating that information out to the group so people can log in if they might want to? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, Steph started not uh, that long ago was a calendar because there was just so much happening. And whether you're on social media or not, it's just hard to keep track of when things are happening. And they're literally happening every week. So this uh, community calendar, any person can submit to, you can just click add an event, enter an, uh, something that you heard about, and it will just pop right into the community calendar. And you can subscribe it if you have like a Google Calendar or iCal, you can just add it to it. And then you get notifications. You don't even have to go find it anywhere else. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so uh, hopefully this helps. Like I signed up for a bunch of workshops that I didn't even know were happening uh, until they came here. So I was like, oh, great. That, that just makes it a lot easier. Wow. Uh, but you know, we, we, we do have a presence on Twitter just because that's where a lot of the initial conversations and people were. Uh, and more recently, we added an Instagram. Uh, we know there's a lot of historian communities that are more active on his Instagram. So that's another opportunity there. Uh, we'll just go wherever people are and are interested in, in talking about these things. Nicely done. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's it. And so resources are many. Oh, we mentioned a couple of the tools that are available here and other wonderful websites that provide additional information. Um, it is not rare that we get uh, an email that says like, um, is this fact true? Like, did this happen at this time? Uh, is there any evidence of this? So there's also the fact checker page that uh, we started just to help kind of identify like, how confident can you be about this piece of information or a particular claim? Uh, so this one, uh, we get a couple of requests every now and then. It's really hard to get ahead of them. Like we have many more requests than we've been able to get, but we'll eventually try to, to get more done. Uh, and as new tools uh, uh, to aid transcription or other kinds of tools like Eliza left this one though you mentioned, Pat, come up, uh, we'll keep adding to, to the resources here. Right, that's great. Yeah. 
And, um, and in, then we also have all of the, the types of, of things that I talked about before, like the, the travel maps and timelines, uh, and then articles that people worked on uh, over time as they pursue more focused research. For example, this uh, work here about uh, Ann Lister's Paris apartment that Marlene and Pauline have like gone really into the deep end and understand that uh, that time of Ann Lister's life and uh, what uh, we learn about her time in Paris uh, where she, she held an apartment for study uh, and uh, what her life was like while living there. Her co constant consideration was of like, is there a better place or with more space that I can uh, uh, do more of my studies or be tutored in any of the circumstances? So, uh, and then, you know, we always get the question, is it still there? Like that, that's a question that happens for every topic. Right. Uh, so we also had some fun comparing some historical uh, maps of the streets of, of Paris to see like, because sometimes you have the same street name, but the numbering system has changed or even the street has been cut up differently. Yeah. Uh, there are some explorations here about then and now. And so if you go there now, uh, you'll find uh, some of those uh, same things and possibly things that Anne Lister has seen, uh, but also a lot of new uh, different things about Paris uh, and some some evidence of things that she has been like. She definitely, this was across uh, next door to uh, Hugh Linet, where uh, one of the apartments was located. And so this building still exists, very much looks the same as the time uh, that Anne Lister was there with just some small modifications. That's the great uh, thing about Paris. One of the other things that I found uh, really interesting when I look through this particular um, uh, resource track or whatever you refer to as, is uh, there's a bit in here about um, when she and Anne Walker were at the apartment and that Anne Walker was taking an inventory of the things that were in the apartment. So there's, it it very much brings Ann Walker into the story as well. It does, and and so cool. And then well, that's one of the reasons we want to make sure, like a lot of these articles are very heavily quoted uh, because we want people to kind of see it in Anne's words, how she was describing that. And that's where you find things like that, like, oh, Ann Walker was like an active participant in the maintenance process here, like inventorying the items and making decisions. Uh, talking about the things that they brought to the apartment that they purchased or things that they left when they went on travels and left behind on the apartment. It really, you know, sometimes gives us some ideas or hints of like, might we find some of these things from the evidence that we see in these examples here? So, right. uh, yeah. so yeah, so lots, lots of areas uh, of opportunity for writing articles like this that just expose some aspect of what we have so far found about Ann Lister and some uh, supporting information that you can really offer if you like take the time like pulling and go to the local archives and 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 see what else is there that we can learn from right can't wait for those archives to reopen uh okay so um now uh let's talk a little bit about you actually decided at some point that this needed to come up off the page up off the internet and uh, well, it stayed on the internet for the time being, but tell us a little bit about what happened next as you decided to move forward. Yeah, so all these great conversations that were happening in these different settings, uh, we would also have sort of ad hoc Zoom conversations between some people uh, in addition to the constant messaging and chats and right. et cetera. Um, and we all knew we needed time. Like we just needed a little more time together to go a little more in depth in certain topics. So we figured we could invite other like-minded people and just share what we already had and talk about it. Like there was really no, no larger ambition other than our, I'm sure there are more people, let's just create a space where they can come to and actually spend that dedicated time, not just a stolen minute here or there. So uh, that was the idea. Uh, and we knew that if we had 20 people showed up, it would be a great conversation. And we knew that if 200 people showed up, it would be also a great conversation. But uh, we wanted to try and both to create the space uh, that we needed for ourselves, but better understand what others were looking for. So that's where the idea for the Enlister Research Summit came from. And let me just uh, clarify for the audience that um, they're not talking about doing it land based. They did it on the Internet. The entire thing took place uh, via the Internet over what, a three day period? 
Yeah, and you know that was definitely um, both a circumstance of uh, happening, all this happening uh, amid a pandemic, but also uh, knowing that this is a very uh, international crowd mm. that has been collaborating. Uh, we knew that having something in person would immediately create a barrier for participation. So we figure at the very the very least starting would require us to create a space where most people could come. So that was the idea for keeping it online to get started. Great. And so um, tell us a little bit about uh, the event itself, uh, what you talked about, who the presenters were, what was your, how did that work? Sure. Uh, so we uh, obviously had a lot of ideas up front of like everything that we wanted to talk about. And we knew that there was more content to cover than we could possibly cover in a reasonable amount of time. So it started as a one day idea and quickly went through a three day just to accommodate like good starting points for everything. But uh, we also, you know, we had not run this conference before. So we thought what would be a good model to kind of reinforce the idea or the values that we were trying to create for the community of inclusion and everyone is welcome regardless of your background. Uh, so we wanted to be a mix of, of like not just the traditional like people come and do a presentation and there's an audience, uh, and, but also sort of the unconference model of people come together for an idea and then have a discussion about it. So we, we did a mix of different formats uh, and that included uh, facilitated discussions where you have a facilitator uh, framing a discussion for a given theme and then every and is responsible for engaging everyone in conversation about that topic. Uh, we also had workshops where instructors provide like hands on information and guidance on how to do something like uh, we did uh, or Amanda and um, Alex did uh, a workshop on how to create a timeline and, and story maps. Um, and we also had show and tells because uh, there was a lot of information that people had or research that they pursued that they just needed a place to kind of share that with everyone and see how people responded. So the show and tells were more like brief expositions of like certain topics. Uh, we also did that as a group. So it's sort of like a facilitated panel uh, where you know, people get to talk a little bit about a topic. We had a wonderful session about all the women in Endlister's life where it's like, five seconds on any one person, and then we can understand a little bit more. So that just gave us a taste of what uh, we could we could get across. And uh, we also just experimented with formats like a bingo to really uh, give people the experience of reading the journals together, which was just wonderful and fun. Uh, and uh, Jessica did, did a trivia session, which was extremely hard for me. Uh, but it was just a good or a good way to, to experiment, like what are different ways we could engage with this content uh, that we take seriously, but it does not ha have to not be fun while we take it seriously. So uh, those are sort of a few different examples of like how you engage it during the summit. So um, Liv, before we go further on the summit, because we didn't touch on this a little earlier, uh, you talked about, or when we chatted uh, beforehand, you talked about how uh, important it was to you to keep people engaged and not just on a research basis, but to, to make it fun and to create different opportunities for people to enter into Ann Lister land mm -hmm. in a different way. So I know you've you've run a couple of different things and one just recently, the Ann Lister Bake Off. Yeah. And, you know, all of these uh, activities just sort of happen. Uh, someone was like, hey, what if we did this thing? Uh, so Ann Lister uh, birthday was coming up and we thought, well, what might we do? I mean, there were many ideas, but uh, I forget now, apologies, whoever suggested a bake-off. Uh, and so we we had a little uh, mini campaign to encourage people to uh, bake something uh, to celebrate and Lister and share it on social media. And then we had a really fun gathering with um, Kate McCabe and Amanda Wilgrove as and Lister judging wow. all of the different uh, uh, creations. And it was just really fun. and. You know, you could really see in the themes that people explored that they were, you know, creating this really fun, delicious thing, but also uh, bringing topics that really show like a really inherent understanding of certain aspects of Enlister life, uh, whether serious or not, uh, yeah. that I think really helps welcome other people to these kinds of activities and these kinds of conversations. Like on um, Valentine's Day, uh, there are a social media uh, campaign also to share these Valentines with quotes from Ann Walker and Ann Lister as well, uh, and kind of 
offer that lens into into her life and and in her own words. So we try to to create opportunities like that, uh, which are uh, complementary to doing the sort of a like hard or more focused research and archival work that we would do on a more robust project like that. I think all these things have a place. Uh, and the thing that they do is that they create a community of people yes. who are have a uh, shared interest um, and as well as making it more welcoming for everyone who's just starting or, you know, we're going to have season two come out. There's going to be a whole new wave of people who are going to be like, well, and Lister, who is that? <laughs> exactly. Here it comes. Yeah. They, they need that starting point. Like it should be really easy to become a participant and start exploring and Lister. Now, uh, Liv, one of the things that you did share with me in our pre-chat was that you ran into a lot of people that had what we call the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, this has been through on um, all of these projects and activities. No matter how passionate people are about Enlister, at first at least, many think that everyone else is an expert, so they have no business researching Enlister themselves, okay. which is absolutely untrue. Uh, simply desiring to learn about Enlister is enough to start, right? Uh, but three years ago, I didn't know anything about Enlister. I never right. didn't know who she was at all and who we are now. Um, I'm still not an expert, but that does that's not the point, right? That the point is not expertise. It's, it's uncovering something that is meaningful to you. So right. even people who approach us with project ideas, like, oh, I have this idea for a tracker. They're like, here's an idea, I'll check it as you develop. And we're like, no, 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 come on in. Like you, you're part of it. Like this is a great idea, let's develop that together. But all of these things require a lot of convincing uh, and people self-select out for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's a technology related one. They're like, I'm not really comfortable with the internet or spreadsheets or whatever it is. I like, can feel really overwhelming. Uh, some also feel overwhelming about transcribing. Like there's always some aspect that may be the thing that is a barrier for someone. Um, and maybe you've never walked into an archive. Like that didn't stop uh, Pauline from like finding all this wonderful information. She's like, okay, well, it's my first time, but I'm gonna do it and look yeah. at what she came out of, right? So, uh, you know, for for the summit specifically, we had tons of ideas of what to do, but we decided that opening a call for participation was helpful both for better understanding what people wanted out of that experience, but also to reinforce that the whole point is getting people to participate. And we had we had no idea how many of you were gonna respond, but we had like 125 people responded to the call for participation. It was the overwhelming majority willing to lend a hand in facilitating a session or doing anything to support the, you know, the existence of something like that. And it still required a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations with many people. Uh, who were super enthusiastic to remind them that this was a place for them and they were legitimate in participating, whatever their background, right? Uh, yeah. We also ran some pre-summit sessions for folks to get comfortable with technology, to help give people a sense of what a conference is like if they've never attended a conference. Um, people responded really well to that. But again, we are told so often by gatekeepers in our lives that we're not enough uh, that we start believing in it, right? And we're not good enough for a particular thing or you don't belong here. So we had to go through great lengths to remind people that that's a lie and everyone belongs and everyone has something to offer to this community. And we're ultimately interested in something uh, about Ann Lister and she's compelling in some way and each per perspective that we bring to bear enriches that conversation. Absolutely. Um, it yeah. requires, uh, like, we, we need to always remind ourselves and keep yeah. reminding each other and make sure that people who are new are hearing that message. Yes, absolutely. And that, and that in fact, is one of the really many wonderful outcomes of Sally's terrific series. And as you say, with season two coming up, I think all of us who've been involved in this for the last two and a half years are, um, are expecting quite an influx. And and by the way, when you talk about how, you know, something like that isn't your day job, I can tell you that it has become mine. So yeah, <laughs> I thought I was retired. Normal, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, tell us what's next for uh, Pack with Potential and the Summit. Well, we've certainly been encouraged to hold another one. So I am very happy to announce that we will be having the next Endless Research Summit on October 15 through 17 this year. 
Um, and you can visit the site and save the date now. Uh, we'll post more information about opening a call for papers once we have that process figured out. Um, last time we put an entire event together in eight weeks and that was a lot of work. So this time we're giving ourselves a little bit more time uh, uh, to plan, but also time for people to develop maybe something that they want to explore or suggest an activity and have plenty of time to work on that over the summer uh, and have a really great time uh, in October. Well, um, so, so you've heard it here first. The, uh, the next Analyster Summit. So those of you who've been listening today that have found this as fascinating as I have and as helpful as I have in terms of where do I go if I want to know this thing, um, Pack with Potential is very definitely busy at that. Uh, it's time for questions now. Liv, you brought it right into the, you, you, right in perfectly. So let's uh, move on to that. Let me see what I've got on the magic screen here. Uh, what would you love to stumble upon or discover related to Ann Lister and her life? Wow. Uh, wow. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned the books. Uh, I, I'm just very curious about uh, what things we can draw a maybe more conclusive thought around, like the things that shaped her. I uh, yes. want to go read those things and see how they affect me. Uh, that's the yeah. first thing that comes to mind. But I think there is probably a lot of her travels where, uh, and, you know, every day people are like, oh, I've been to this hotel. I didn't know she was there. Uh, I am curious if we might find artifacts uh, right. of, from her, uh, whether it's a note or a signature in a book or something like that. Those, those things I think would be really fun and interesting to uncover. There's, I can, I can think of three things right off the bat. Number one, I'd like to know where she's actually buried in the minster. Um, number two, I would really like to know what became of her library. I, you know, if somebody out there is interested in starting a tracking project for books that have popped up with her signature in it, I know Ann Choma owns one of them. I've heard of a couple of other ones. It would be fascinating to find find out what happened because whether you know this or not, audience at large, um, her library was auctioned off, so it just went out to the wind. And yeah, the the, yeah. the book uh, the bookshelf project. Also, we added that a column so that if there is a known book, either belonging right. to Endless or R. N. Walker, that's marked there. So if people people see that, and I also transcribe the inventory of the sale that we, we have data on. So we also know which books were part of that, uh, but finding those would be, would be marvelous. Do you, do you have any idea, oftentimes, um, especially in those days, when people were started to build grand houses with grand libraries, they'd often buy an entire library and stick it in there, whether they ever open the book again. Do you have any way to find out if that happened to any of Anne's books? Well, the challenge is traceability, right? If, if usually the last point where you have that record is if there is a uh, inventory, uh, either at the end of a state sale or something like that. Uh, but then whether the person who purchased a collection has kept any inventory of that is really unknown, but you may then refine that if they have a state sale at some point and an inventory is created. So you can always look for the name of the volumes and actually go try to actually look at the physical volume and see, is there a signature? Is there an indicator? Right. Uh, that one is going to be uh, a lot of people going to state sales. Yeah. <laughs> the general Yorkshire area for uh, for the foreseeable future and, and looking for some opportunities. Yes, and oddly enough, again, to the audience out there, that um, certain Ann Lister items have actually, or items related to Ann Lister have shown up in the United States in, in, uh, in the uh, estates of people whose families were distantly connected. So open up your books, <laughs> see what you got. You never know. Like the the New York Library uh, has purchased a set of documents. Uh, I think it was about seven years ago, yeah. uh, which included a copy of Endlister's will, included some other uh, uh, documentation relative to her time. Like it was bought as a bundle uh, because the curator knew who Endlister was and saw the name and and purchased that. Uh, but again, like you never know where it might pop in. Like once I heard that, I just went straight to New York to look at that. <laughs> And it was just so fun to be able to like see this physical artifact. Right, and, and have it in your hands, right? Or to see it. Um, okay, another question. This is from Natalie Bourdon. 
Uh, have you considered translating sections of the pack with potential site into another language? Are there similar sites in other languages? I'm so glad you asked that question because yes, of course, with such an international crowd, we know that language is a, a big barrier. Uh, English is a good simplifying language, but we, uh, of course, and Lister Italia is an awesome site uh, that uh, Frankie and Lucia maintain. Uh, and uh, they've done an amazing job now that uh, Gentleman Jack has been released there, uh, doing like some fact checks and helping the new audience uh, learn about Ann Lister. Uh, there is a very large community of uh, Ann Lister enthusiasts in Brazil. Uh, they're starting a blog. Uh, they've talked about uh, translating some of the work that is published today. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we might develop. Um, um, I also had people reach out about uh, Chinese translations as well. So. That's something underway. So I would say anyone who is interested in supporting that, uh, please ping us. I would love to help facilitate that, whether it is creating in-language versions of anything that exists. Uh, but we do need help maintaining those resources once they're created, because that's where like, we don't want it to be stale and out of date, but we want it to be a rich uh, thing that people can come to. Yeah. Uh, but the language question comes up even in the context of the summit. And I suggest that maybe you know, in the next one, we can have uh, some parallel sessions in language where people can discuss and listen in their own language where they may not be comfortable or ready to discuss that in a, in a space in a different language. So uh, we're trying to work on some things for that. But if you have any ideas, please, let's work on them. Yeah, that's a really excellent point right there, because it is such a hugely international community. And in order to be welcoming at some point, it's, it's nice to be speaking in that language. Uh, this question is from Patricia Book. How do you edit and check contributions, validate or correct as new information comes in? So a um, variety of ways. So all of the content that is published through this website, uh, there's someone who's looking at it, uh, both the person who's contributing and also people supporting that. Uh, to making sure everything is referenced, right? That's really the starting point for anything. The same right. way that we're trying to offer a, a list of references, if you're making a statement about anything, that statement needs to come from somewhere. Uh, and so we wanna make sure everything has a reference to a historical record or something that people can then visit and validate and right. feel confident in what's being said as well as pursue more. So that's like a starting point. The other one is just sort of like editorial guidance as you're like shaping a story, uh, like don't make claims that you can substantiate. Like you can hypothesize uh, an idea of like how something comes about, but uh, you know, stating that is a different problem. So right. helping people uh, author these stories and edit them in a way that is accurate is definitely step one. And that's something we want to develop a lot more. We want to have a more articulated way to like, how can people do that? Because it's not just about publishing on this side. I want people to publish wherever they're publishing and still kind of keep that spirit in mind that always referencing things, don't make claims you can corroborate uh, right. are, are really the, 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 not the ceiling, but uh, the floor of the conversation. Right. Okay. Uh, this is from Jess Payne. How do I find people to work on a project with if I have an idea? Um, so the way people have been doing is they send a contact email and they're like, is anyone already working on this? Or this is the thing I'm considering. Can someone help me out? Uh, and we just try to connect people that we already know. What we don't have really a good way is to just support people just connecting with each other very well. So that's something in addition to the summit that we're working on now. Uh, which is to create a space uh, where people can engage with together. And we didn't want to just like create some like group and then have like it die out or just become really cumbersome. So we were trying to be really thoughtful about it. Uh, but we are working on creating a space where everyone can come together with more opportunities for collaboration and interaction. And uh, we uh, want to make sure that that space is as welcoming as all of these other activities uh, and sustainable on its own. So stay tuned. That's going to be coming uh, in the next uh, months. So Liv, what is the email address they should use? Uh, the easiest way is just go to the website, click contact. This way, no one has to remember anything. <laughs> just go in and type Perfect. in there. Uh, we we 
uh, we have uh, five folks who are helping facilitate uh, sort of the engine of like maintaining all these projects. I just want to call out Steph Galloway, Chantal Smith, Amanda Price, and Marlene Oliveira. So we all get the email. One of us will like take the lead on like, I'll take this one and then connect people. Uh, so uh, please go just, just get in touch and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll help you get connected. Right, and I can tell you, I thank you, Steph. Yeah, because it is packwithpotential.org, not .com. And I can tell you that I sent a question in the other day because I just wanted, before we got into the interview, I wanted to see how it worked and I got an answer back within 24 hours and right. um, it was done quickly, professionally, and I got everything I needed out of it. Uh, this is also from Jess Payne. Do I need any specific skills or knowledge to become involved with Pact with Potential? Uh, you need to be interested. Uh, yeah, there you go. Really, that's really it. Um, one of the things that we articulated for the summit were just some values that we want to make sure that whoever is coming to this is is understanding that we. Uh, we're inquisitive and respectful. We elevate and lister the person uh, and we support one another. And that's really the spirit of it. So if you're coming in and you're like, I have no skills, that's first of all, not true. You do have skills. You just maybe don't know how your skills fit into a project that exists or an idea that you have. Uh, but you know, we figure it out. Like I have a skill of like organizing information. That's why I started the list of resources. Uh, so everyone has something to bring to bear and there is no prerequisite. Uh, and if there is something you want to do that maybe seems more advanced or challenging, or there is a barrier, we're also there to help facilitate that. Uh, we, we've been talking for a while to have like a little session about like using spreadsheets or just using Google Drive as a whole, like we can do these things. So for any project or any idea, uh, including like the community's needs for understanding how to work with tools and things like that, we can just get together and learn together uh, and share what we do know from the skills that we do have. So bring whatever uh, you have. And if that is just an interest and enthusiasm, that's what we want. Everything else can come later. That's great. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, this is from LR Brundage. What aspect of the Anns, Ann Walker and Ann Lister, life interests you the most? Has anything had a personal impact on you? That's an interesting question. I have to think on a moment. Um, I but this is going to be controversial. I think the the relationship between Ann Walker and Ann Lister is really interesting in how it's evolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, in the beginning, it, it may seem from reading the journals that uh, there's like a little bit of conflict or in, and some of the, the ideas that make it seem as if Ann Lister was taking advantage of Ann Walker. And as you start seeing that develop over time, you see that actually these are just really regular people problems okay. <laughs> coming together for the first time and learning each other's styles of conversation. Uh, what does the other person look like when they're cranky? And you really see that unfold over the years. And it was just, just delightful to observe. So that was, that was very heartwarming uh, to see and learn as I started reading on the transcriptions because you know, I've been married for 19 years and I'm like, ah, I have seen a journey just like that. Yeah. And it's just really nice to see that as part of, of their life. Uh, but I'm also really interested in the other relationships and Lister had before uh, and Walker because that was the only relationship where she just started already so much more mature. Uh, yeah. And then her uh, experience with, with other people in her life, she was just in such a different headspace. So um, I'm particularly interested in that arc with Mariana because they've known each other for much longer. Um, so they both grew uh, over time in different ways. So I like seeing how she relates to different people at different parts of her life in different ways and how much she's learned from all of these experiences. Right, and to the, and to the entire point about having packed with potential as well as all the rest of the fantastic research that's going on out there and the papers that are being written and all the academic study and the rest of it is that all we had to go on in 2019 when those of us who came across Gentleman Jack at that moment and dove into Nerdland were some 
older papers, et cetera, that were written by people who really didn't want to talk about the fact that Ann Lister was a lesbian. And so when they did make allusions to Ann Lister and Ann Walker, without going into any great detail at this point, um, you found some really negative information about their relationship. And so the fact that we're now seeing more of the transcription, that the diaries are becoming clear to all of us, it is really interesting, as you say, Livia, to see how this relationship developed, deepened, changed over time, as it does, especially as we get older. <laughs> so uh, final question. This is from Christine Santos. Do you think it's possible to find someone to study about Ann Walker's mental struggles in that time? Uh, there is a lot to be uncovered there. Um, there is already work looking at just factually how does the how did the process of her lunacy uh, commission came about? What were the circumstances? Uh, but I think someone with a background uh, in uh, uh, mental health. Uh, really has a great opportunity here to look at a historical perspective of like, not just the portrayal of mental health issues, but uh, to what extent uh, Ann, Ann Walker or Ann Lister or anyone mm -hmm. um, uh, presented uh, with evidence uh, of any particular struggles and how much of it was just circumstantial and part of the narrative people created about them for nefarious purposes or other purposes. Right. Uh, so I think that would be a fantastic thing for someone with that background to explore. Is there a tracker existing right now that talks about, I know that Ann Lister talks about Ann Walker's uh, moods, that she was not happy or she spent the last few days in bed, you know, whatever it was. Um, mm -hmm. Is anybody tracking that? Uh, there is a nascent tracker about, um, sort of uh, complaints and there was there's more like a health tracker yeah. uh, that's starting uh, and we're gonna do some consolidation because we also don't want to overwhelm people with like a million trackers like can we can yeah. we can we scope this in a way that's a little more uh, uh, manageable uh, and I think that could be one of the settings in which that information gets surfaced definitely yeah I think that the 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 further inclusion of Ann Walker, into the Ann Lister story and pack with potential could be, uh, and I know that there's a lot in there already, it's amazing, um, could, could be a really interesting subject for somebody to take on. Well, uh, Livia, I wanna thank you for coming on today. And uh, you really, it's, and to all of you that are working on pack with potential, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal resource. Uh, a great place to go. I go there myself when I'm trying to check particular dates and times, those kinds of things. And uh, I highly recommend it. Really well done. And thanks for your time today, Liv. And thank you for letting me represent this immense number of people who take yeah. the time and energy and really put their heart into it and are so uh, open to sharing and learning together. Thank you all so very much. Uh, I really appreciate you incredibly. And thank you, Pat, for having us. It's my pleasure, Liv. Thanks so much. See you soon. Well, so ALBW land, um, that is fascinating. And as Livia has said, if you're an Ann Lister nerd, this is the place to go. So, uh, and I'm one, I'm a proud Ann Lister nerd. So uh, first of all, as usual, I wanna thank the team. As always, Liv, Kat and, uh, and uh, Cheryl in the background. And um, coming up next on ALBW Live, we have Carol Adlam talking about her Elizabeth, uh, Jesus, uh, Eliza Rain um, graphic novel, which is fascinating and quite beautiful, I might also add. Uh, we're going to be talking to Bates Preservation about uh, the work that they're doing on How End, which is uh, the home of the Priestleys and was used as the home of the Priestleys in uh, Gentleman Jack. Also, the Rossons live there. So they've taken that project on. Uh, there is a lot about uh, how and that is still um, specific to the time period in which Ann Lister spent time in that home. So it's that'll be fascinating. And we have a whole list of other things coming up. Those are just the next two. So um, I want to thank all of you who have tuned in today. I hope that all of you are planning on coming to Ann Lister Birthday Week, which will be... Um, uh, April 2nd through the 9th, uh, 2022, to be held in Halifax, England. 
And once again, I want to say thanks. I want you all to stay healthy, and I want you to wear your masks. See you next time.